It's Monday. It's March 13th. And the word of the day is ipsodixitism, which means the assertion that something is fact because someone else said so. Used in a sentence, I'm going to start calling the Republican Party the Ipsodixocrats. <laughs> <laughs> also the source for all guests on Be Reasonable. How apropos. <laughs> sure. Hey, hey, that's not fair. Sometimes they're people that I found in a god-awful movie about root canals. So there's different <laughs> sources. I'm Michael Marshall. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center and the UK, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, watching the January 6th tapes backwards shows they were actually cleaning. <laughs> we get an inside look into just how incompetently the Tories handled COVID. <laughs> and Dilbert gets called in for a really tough meeting with HR. But first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, Michael Marshall and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, you got any ipsodixitisms that you want to mention before we get started, since that's the, the new game today? At this point, I've seen literally dozens of tweets that Marsh did COVID, and there's like three websites, so... <laughs> yeah, no, I've, from yourself. I've seen cool. those too, Eli. I have seen those too. <laughs> um, oh, oh um, how about QD 2023 will be September 23rd and 24th? I was told Ooh. that by Andy. Although, in fairness, he does have a copy of the hotel contract, so this, this really was just an excuse to get the plug right at the very top there. That's all this was for me. Best birthday present ever <laughs> <laughs> also marsh before we get started just want to talk about a late breaking story that we didn't get to fully cover mm. here in our notes but um i did get a message from you when i woke up today that said well today is an excellent day for my country to be going through a ludicrous pantomime of a political culture war meltdown <laughs> so uh what might that be about? Yeah, no, you're very lucky that I was allowed to appear on this show because uh, I've criticised the government <laughs> at some point in my life and therefore I should be silenced and stick to uh, stick to my day job. Yeah, no, the, the government has decided to uh, pick a fight with genuine national treasure Gary Lineker, the presenter of uh, the flagship sports programme, Match of the Day, and also former England football captain who was never booked in his entire career because he's such a nice guy, he never even got a caution. He never even got a card? Never even got a card, despite playing like hundreds and hundreds of times and scoring hundreds and hundreds of goals. Wow. Never got a single yellow card. He's just that much of a nice guy. He criticised the government for being a little bit fascisty towards migrants with their latest policy of if anybody comes here in a boat, we're sending them back to France and uh, calling them a swarm and an invasion and uh, dehumanising them and things. That sounds a little fascisty. I feel like <laughs> he was being super nice about it. He said it sounded a little bit like 1930s. You know, it was a little bit 1930s Germany, uh, which means that Gary Lineker should never be allowed on the national broadcast of the BBC ever again for uh, in any way considering it appropriate to say that the government are leaning into fascism in even the gentlest of language. And then the fun thing about that was he was dropped from the, like I said, the, the biggest sports programme in the country. He was dropped from being the presenter of that. So two other regulars on there, Ian Wright, who is, again, national treasure, and Alan Shearer, who I love so much, his birthday is my Wi-Fi password. That's a genuinely true oh, thing. he's in like a drinking song, if I remember correctly. <laughs> he's the fucking greatest, Alan Shearer. I love him so much. He's he's brought me more joy than any other human being, probably, in the, in the entirety of my life. I love him. Wow. And they both said, well, if Lineker's not doing it, then we're not fucking doing it. And basically everyone at the BBC sports team has, uh, has joined the strike to a point where now love it. even the footballers have said, oh, we're not going to talk to the BBC this weekend because of the way they've treated Gary <laughs> Oh, That's fantastic. Rough. So the BBC are going to go ahead with the sports programme with no presenters. It's just going to cut straight into footage of the games. The commentators have said, we aren't going to work it, so they're not going to have anyone to describe what's going on. <laughs> they've got no one to talk about it after the game and no one from involved in the game at all will talk to them. But um, that's going super great for everyone involved. It's weird to play chicken as your car has already been totaled and you're being dragged behind the <laughs> semi-truck you ran into. Yeah. It seems like this might work, though. Like, if there's anybody who has more power in the UK than the centuries-old lizard aliens who run royalty and run the BBC secretly, it's 
football players, right? So, a hundred percent. And the thing is, this is a lesson that the government should learn not to take on footballers because during the pandemic, when children were back at school, there, there was a lot in the news about how people were struggling to feed their kids, and lots of kids weren't were going without meals, and the only meal that they would be able to get was the one that they were having for free at school. Then it came to summer. And the government said, well, we are not going to make any efforts to feed children if they're not at school. And a footballer, Marcus Rashford, Man United striker, said, no, you should definitely do something about this. And they decided to try and uh, crucify Rashford as like a walk ideologue. And they lost so badly that they ended up having to like sit down on camera with Rashford and talk (laughs) through how they were actually going to feed schools. Like, don't fuck with the footballers. Don't don't radicalize footballers against you. It's a really bad idea. You've got a lot of people who care about these people a lot. Love that. Okay. A little bit of good news to start the day. It was there's some bad news obviously but in there with the fascism thing. The fascism is not not ideal. It's it's also deeply enjoyable that all of the people in like senior positions at the BBC currently are there because they gave money to the Tory party or used to actually be Tory MPs or candidates. But it's the football presenters who need to stay out of politics. It's not the people who are literally setting the agenda of the BBC who gave Boris Johnson an £800,000 loan in order to get the position where he tells the BBC what to do. It's, it's, it's not important yes. that he lives his <laughs> politics aside. It's only the football guy. What's important is that we're nice to JK Rowling. That's <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, speaking of bigots and fascists, in our lead story tonight, in Tuck Your Face News, we learned this week that Tucker Carlson is not a credible news source, actually. Big scoop. After being gifted exclusive access to 40,000 hours of security camera footage from inside the Capitol during the J6 attack by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Tucker put together a fun little montage of the events like a bar mitzvah video of all the peaceful reverie (laughs) among the mob of domestic terrorists and presented that as news on his television show of news, asterisk. Yeah, they they were entirely peaceful. And also, I wasn't speeding when I was on the highway, as this 30-second clip of me getting into my car clearly proves I was not speeding (laughs) at that point. (laughs) Look, it's at zero. I'm not even driving. (laughs) And in response, the White House released a statement to Carlson they, they, they just had Carol Kane popping out of their letterhead and screaming, liar! It was fun. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, good times here in the post-truth universe in America. I yeah. know people like to do a lot of, like, there's crazies on both sides about American politics. But I feel like if George W.'s administration had to come out and condemn, I don't know, CNN for showing zeitgeist after 9-11, we'd remember it. It had been a thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, in response to the absurd patriotic picnic video from Carlson, the White House explained how information works, Tim. Turns out you can't just present footage out of context to build a lie very well when other people have all that footage too. So basically the White House said like, wow, dude, you're fucking dumb. You thought the executive branch didn't have access to national security footage? You didn't think we were going to check that shit? But they said it a little bit nicer than that. Here's the actual statement from White House spokesperson Andrew Bates, quote, we agree with the chief of the Capitol Police and the wide range of bipartisan lawmakers who have condemned this false depiction of the unprecedented violent attack on our Constitution and the rule of law, which cost police officers their lives. We also agree with what Fox News's own attorneys and executives have now repeatedly stressed in multiple courts of law that Tucker Carlson is not credible, end quote. Right. And that would be very significant if Tucker's audience cared about information from literally any source but him. Right? These are people who wouldn't double check if he told them the sun had disappeared from the sky. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> here's the response from Tucker Carlson after being called out on his very obvious lie. He claimed that only a tiny little group of people that day were hooligans. And uh, Marsh, as a rabid Newcastle United fan and a notoriously violent soccer hooligan. Yeah. Just <laughs> dozens of confirmed kills. 100%. If I understand correctly. I'm sure you can verify that all of you are offended by that comparison. Oh God, yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Heath. This is this is deeply offensive. And look, I can understand his confusion, right? Because like the January 6th folk, soccer hooligans also get together to dress in team colours and shout aggressive chants. But those chants generally aren't usually calling for the summary execution of the country's second in command. See, that is the difference between us. 
I mean, yeah, okay. generally, but I- I've I've seen Newcastle fans march. I feel like you should you should couch that language slightly more. <laughs> so, from there, Carlson also added the following to describe the again domestic terrorist mob. That's what happened. We all know that's what happened. We saw videos of it. This is how he described them. Quote: They were peaceful. They were orderly and meek. He said meek. These were not insurrectionists. They were sightseers. End quote. Okay. <laughs> sightseers. Meek sightseers. That's mm. what happened that okay. day. Okay. But even if that were true, they were sightseeing illegally, right? Yeah. As I'm being yeah. escorted out of a CIA black site where I'm sightseeing, nobody cares how politely I was walking around taking <laughs> pictures of the nukes. And things like, yeah, I'm sure it was a great comfort to the 140 police officers who were there to find out that they were injured peacefully. I mean, I say 140 who were there. They were the ones who were there on duty. There was a a whole bunch of other police officers who turned up at the Capitol on their day off, you know, to sightsee. They were there sightseeing. Yeah, no, it's confusing. Just off-duty cops meekly sightseeing. Yep. So uh, Tucker Carlson might not be a good source of information. That's what we learned. This may come as a big surprise if you weren't familiar with a court case during which Fox News had to literally make the argument that Tucker Carlson being a giant liar... That doesn't count because his show is very clearly full of ridiculous claims and no reasonable person could assume it's a legitimate news program. That's what the White House was referencing in their statement. (laughs) Also, he looks like a middle school kid woke up at a news desk in a bad 80s movie that somehow like time traveled him and he's got like Benjamin Button. But he's a kid like big, but for like small alt-right news guys. (laughs) Yeah. And he's very confused. He's squinting. He doesn't know what's happening. Well... I think we're going to need a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Okay, what about sunning my holes? Nope. Uh, Chakra cleansing. Also very clearly no. Hey, guys, what you doing there? Oh, hey, Heath, I'm trying to be my best self, but Marsh keeps telling me that all the things I'm doing aren't real. Because they're not. Well... Eli, if you want to get closest to your best self, why not try therapy? Therapy? Isn't that just for old-timey cartoons and straight jackets that go... No, no, definitely not that. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding. Because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. And BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Wait, how are they going to connect me to a therapist? It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Wow, that sounds great. It is. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. All right, Eli, so what do you say? Fine, fine, I'll stop those other things, but I'm leaving the jade egg where it is. Yeah, that's that's probably for the best. Yeah, yeah, I would. And we're back. Next up in headlines in the Harder They Fall news, Mitch McConnell fell and hurt himself. Oh, did he get hurt? Yeah. Now, to be fair, that's the story. <laughs> really going to be stretching mm. to get a, a second sentence out of this here on our Just program. say he fell and hurt himself again. Just but, say the but same he, sentence. But he again. fell and hurt himself. There you go. Yeah, and we don't <laughs> get enough good news here on the show, so I'll be damned if I'm not going to try and milk this baby for a whole Skeptocrat headline. Okay. I mean, given his appearance, which I would describe as high viscosity, <laughs> I would have assumed a fall wouldn't be that big of a deal, you know, just like structurally for him. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm happy to be wrong about that. Super glad he fell and hurt himself. Yeah, I would I would have assumed a slinky situation. Right? <laughs> so, so here's the story. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch, who spends most of his time these days being upset about being called a minority anything, has always had a contentious relationship with gravity, as demonstrated by his face. Now, scientists aren't exactly sure why, but many podcasters theorize that the devil is actually doing his best to drag him to hell cheeks first, and McConnell <laughs> is putting up one hell of a fight so far. <laughs> Yeah, he he's sort of like the aircon's broken at the stop motion animation studio, and so they've got to really quickly try and finish the film with a clear model before it fully melts. That's kind of what's yeah. going on with him, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, I uh, feel like we need to like scrape it. When he dies, we need to check for like Jurassic Park mosquitoes. Like we might be able to find some good science stuff in there. Sure. Anyway, David Pop, communications director for Mitch McConnell and man who I assume puts a gun in his mouth every night before bed, praying for the courage to do the only brave thing he's ever done. Anyways, that guy, he filled us in on the details. Quote, Leader McConnell tripped at a dinner event Wednesday evening and has been admitted to the hospital and is being treated for a concussion. He is expected to remain in the hospital for a few days of observation and treatment, end quote. Now, CNN added that it was specifically the former Trump International Hotel, and I think we can all agree this is not the first time Trump brought McConnell down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can say what you like about Trump, but that guy has got his finger on the pulse of what's popular. Because would anything have a more favorable approval rating than almost killing Mitch McConnell? I'm not sure it would. Well... I can think of something with almost all the same words that you just said, right? <laughs> yeah. So we here at the Skeptocrat obviously wish the senator speedy recovery, not a death in anguish and alone. So while I find a big Native American guy to befriend him in the hospital and really hope our audience gets my one flew over the cuckoo's noose reference, we'll kick things back over to Marsh for our next story. <laughs> and in the WhatsApp docs news... Um, Fantastic. <laughs> you know that bit in the Alex Jones trial where he found out that his lawyer had given a copy of his entire phone to the prosecution? Watch it every day. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, here in the UK, we've had our, our very own that moment recently because 100,000 messages from the government's private WhatsApp channel during the pandemic were leaked to the Daily Telegraph newspaper. So the leak includes conversations from then PM Boris Johnson, uh, the former Chancellor and current PM Rishi Sunak, and the former Health Secretary Matt Hancock. And it does feature some pretty incredible stuff in there. Okay, I'm assuming lots of selfies with people slathered in horse paste, like really upsetting pictures <laughs> they sent around. Well, there's the bit where Matt Hancock mocked people who were in quarantine because of the pandemic. And there's the bit where he ignores the advice to test the people who were going into the care homes, which led to the deaths of literally tens of thousands of old people because they didn't bother checking if they had COVID or not. Okay, nobody can be in box zero, Marsh. These things happen. Come on. <laughs> and then there is the bit where Victorian cosplayer Jacob Rees-Mogg had a COVID test couriered to his house during a time of national shortage presumably then refusing to use it unless it was brought to him under a silver cloche and administered by an 80-year-old servant that he still calls nanny, <laughs> which is a real thing that he really genuinely has. I didn't believe it. And by the way, the when you Google <laughs> Jacob Reese mug nanny, it's mm. exactly what you're picking. Go ahead, it, picture it's, it. It's picture exactly it. that. You did it. Is, it. You it's, generated it's his nanny. it in your mind. It, yeah. is, it is the lady who wiped his ass while he was a child that he continues to employ as a 50-something-year-old man. Also, side note, I feel like nobody has told Mog the second half of what happens to out-of-touch aristocrats throughout history. Although, now that I think about it, I do want him to be surprised. So you know what? Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure everyone in the UK gets just about every meal under a silver cloche served by a nanny on a very long table, right? Like, yeah, that's what exactly. I saw when I was there. Yeah, yeah no, that is absolutely true. That is, that Marsh, is you, have, you have an absurdly long table that you Oh, eat it's on, so right? long. It's it's ludicrous. Yeah. By the time that the food gets to me at this end of the table, it's already gone cold. It's a, it's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> yeah. The dinner at the end of QED, 47 hours long because each nanny has to come and, and declose. Yeah, the length of the table alone adds a lot of time to it. Uh, so then there was also the bit where Boris Johnson didn't know the difference between a decimal probability and a percentage. Yeah, which is so stupid. Which led him to underestimate the COVID fatality rate by a factor of 100. Um, but that is a level of fatal innumeracy that we've come to expect from a man who still can't accurately count the number of children that he has. So it's fair. Oh, God. He went to Eton and Oxford, mm. right? And he's still this stupid. They yeah, need absolutely. to release a statement. Those two schools <laughs> have to be like, oh, I'm really sorry. We keep fucking up and sending people out that do terrible shit. I think if Eton and Oxford started releasing apologies, I don't think they'd be doing anything yeah, else I was for a long say, time. Yeah, stop. <laughs> Harvard, Yale, a lot of people have to Also, do that, Heath, yeah. let's not start a precedent of prestigious universities disavowing their uh, less welcome members. I, I, eventually, <laughs> NYU is going to get to me. Let's look at Yale. Let's be cool. <laughs> Oh, uh, but of all of the revelations that we've had so far, and they're still coming out, but of all the ones we've had so far, uh, my favourite concerns the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which was introduced by Rishi Sunak when he was Chancellor in August 2020. It which sounds is, pretty cool. Yeah, I don't know where you're going with this, but it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> it's not quite what you're thinking. Uh, it's oh, where okay. the government paid you to eat out in restaurants to help stimulate the economy. They paid half of the cost of your food if you went to a restaurant 
six months before the vaccine was out at a Yikes. time where we had 40,000 deaths. So a fifth of what we've gone on to have, they were paying you to be out in public. Right. But Rishi Sunak probably heard that from Boris Johnson. He probably heard it was only like 400 deaths and it turned out it was 40,000. <laughs> so he was paying to kill way less people in his head, right? Because he yeah. heard the that, decimals that is, wrong. That is fair. Uh, So at that time, we've actually learned that Matt Hancock, while he was health secretary, he told a colleague that they were already starting to see a related rise in COVID cases where the scheme was popular, but that he personally intervened to keep that news out of the newspapers. And then when he was texting his colleagues, he called this flagship policy of the man who now runs our country, eat out to help the virus get about. Oof. Okay, sure. They knowingly spread the plague, but... How else were they going to stimulate the economy, Marsh? They're just the government. There's nothing they could do. There's nothing they could do. (laughs) That is fair. Their hands were tied. Um, So all of this is is not great. And and it looks particularly bad for Sunak and for Hancock. Um, Bear in mind, Sunak, he's now in charge. And there's an election going to be happening at some point. And he was really hoping we'd just forget his whole role in the mishandling of this pandemic. Like, that would just slip our minds. Hmm. So do some British voters have object permanence? That sounds so nice, right? (laughs) Americans vote like we all just got fooled by peekaboo. And like the lie's (laughs) gone. Yeah, Yeah, vote for that guy. Uh, And as for Matt Hancock, he's no longer in a position of authority within the Tory party. He's probably not going to carry on as a a Tory, uh, Tory minister. But it looks bad for him because he was the source of this leak that's made him look like an idiot. He recently published his diaries from during the pandemic, and to help him write them, he hired a right-wing tabloid journalist called Isabel Orkshot. And to help her do that, to help her write and edit this diary, he gave her access to all of his WhatsApp messages. And so she delivered the book, (laughs) and then she promptly handed over all of his private messages to a hostile newspaper. (laughs) Obviously, that's what's going to happen. Obviously. Look. If you want me to write this book that only shitty Tory dads are going to buy, I need at least the last four of your social and your pin number. It's for <laughs> art. It's for art. It's honestly, it's it's incredible. Now, I, I, I can't imagine how it feels to have screenshots of your private messenger conversations become the subject of news stories. I just can't imagine what that's like. Uh, but before you feel too sorry for Matt Hancock, it is worth pointing out He should have seen this coming. So Isabel Oakshot was an anti-lockdown libertarian, so she was a vocal critic of the way that Matt Hancock himself handled the pandemic. Plus, in 2018, she wrote a book about the leading Brexit campaigner, Aaron Banks, which involved him giving her access to all of his emails, which she duly leaked to the newspapers in exactly the same way she's doing now. Obviously! Yeah! (laughs) This, it's wow. like the parable of the scorpion and the frog, but where the scorpion <laughs> spent years saying that someone should sting that fucking frog, and then somehow the frog ends up paying for the privilege of being stung. <laughs> right, and the scorpion's fucking fine. It's like the scorpion showed up at the river with the boat they just bought using the frog's money. <laughs> and the frog was like, all right, I'll swim. Across. I don't know why you want me to swim right next to your boat right now. It doesn't help. Yeah, whatever, I'll do it. <laughs> also, my mother's maiden name is, is Password. It's weird, but yeah, it's Password. <laughs> So all of these messages are now handed over to the COVID-19 inquiry. Uh, And Hancock says, well, these leaks are just an attempt to subvert the official inquiry and to get ahead of the narrative. Which is a bit fucking rich, given that these leaks originated with him publishing a How I Saved Britain from the Virus book before (laughs) this inquiry. How I Tried to Get Ahead of the Narrative, my book about (laughs) the virus. Yeah. So we will wait for the official inquiry, but in the meantime, we can enjoy at least one of the few really pure forms of entertainment that we still have left, which is watching arse-covering Tories tear each other apart. Yeah, and really famous football players (laughs) ruining a bunch of Tories too. Good stuff. And next up in headlines, we have a story about Dilbert creator Scott Adams. For anyone who's not familiar, Dilbert is a comic strip, and Scott Adams made a career out of... Lazy drawing and mild, kind of boring observational humor about office politics. And then, right after we recorded our last episode, moments later, Scott Adams fired up his YouTube channel and he started listing his racial enemies like a Bing chatbot doing a speech at CPAC. (laughs) Number one on that list was black people, by the way, who he called a hate group. I mean, they are a hate group in that they are a group that hate him. But you sure. know, if we're, we're going to go sure. by that metric, all of humanity is a hate group to Scott yeah, Adams. That, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> kind of makes the word not that useful at that point. So within minutes, the comic strip got dropped from just about every single newspaper in the country. That was fun. Okay, but 
if you've been following Scott Adams for the last few years, the biggest reaction you have to that news is, wait, there were newspapers still carrying Scott Adams? <laughs> People have weird lines. Can I say that? <laughs> weird lines. Wait, there are still newspapers? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> so the insane rant happened on his YouTube show called Real Coffee with Scott Adams. And based on that episode, I watched a bit of it. Here's the basic format. He boomers his way through turning on a webcam very badly. And after a long struggle with, I'm assuming, VCR cables connected to nothing, the show finally starts mid-sentence, seriously, during some kind of intro he was already doing. Then he does a terrible, terrible poem about coffee. It feels like it's the same one every time, every episode. It's a very sexual ode. And he doesn't seem to realize it also it's about coffee. It's very sexual. It's like a middle school kid trying to get a hege from the concept of coffee. And he wrote this thing really bad. Then he makes hard eye contact with the camera while he takes a big creepy sip from his mug. He calls this the simultaneous sip. So I guess everybody who watches him does a sip along with him. Again, it's weirdly creepily sexual. And then he talks about stories from the news that really grind his gears as a fucking boomer. Yeah, so basically it's Heath's morning routine if we did video, everybody. Okay, I'm, I, I'm working on a better poem. I'm working on it. I'll improve it. I'll touch it up. So he starts talking about the news, and the story that he definitely should have skipped was about a Rasmussen poll that asked people, do you agree or disagree with the statement, it's okay to be white? And apparently 26% of black respondents said no, with another 21% saying, I'm not sure. Which led Scott Adams to announce that black people are a hate group. And he added, quote, the best advice I would give to white people is to get the hell away from black people. End exact quote. Seriously. I mean, if you're watching Scott Adams' creepy coffee sip hour on YouTube, I'm pretty sure black people would agree, so <laughs> they, they would like you to do that. Good point. See, I thought the best advice that Scott Adams could give to white people was stick to generic broad appeal humor and pitch you an industry where more than 80% of the decision makers share the same race as you. I thought <laughs> yeah. that's his advice. Yeah. Yeah. That is very good business advice in general. Yeah. So before we get into the rest of his rant, let's just think about the context of the poll itself. First of all, it's from Rasmussen. They're liars. They lie. They're basically a Republican super PAC with questionnaires. And they word their poll questions like a fucking movie lawyer for a serial killer doing cross-examination of a witness. And <laughs> that's exactly what happened with this poll. Right. So it was like reverse racist says what? What? Fuck. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> like that. So again, they asked people, do you agree with the phrase, it's okay to be white? And- that would be a crazy thing to say out loud. Just imagine that. Like, if you're at Starbucks and you hear somebody say, it's okay to be white out loud, you got to be thinking to yourself, what the fuck is wrong with this person? So lots of people who took the poll, regardless of race, I would imagine, were probably thinking about somebody saying that ridiculous phrase, and then they were responding to the poll with, I don't agree with that person conceptually, or... I'm not sure if I agree with that person conceptually. And of course, because that person would be a lunatic. That's right. insane to say. And it's worth mentioning that quite a few people would recognize it's okay to be white as the racist dog whistle it's been over the last four years. This is exactly. literally like mm -hmm. asking people what they think of the phrase make America great again and then reporting that people don't want America to be great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. This person doesn't think that all of the lives matter. That makes them the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> You're a hate group. Yeah. And here's a bit more from Scott Adams as he slowly lowered himself into a vat of unemployment live on YouTube. This was really fun to watch. <laughs> he claims he spent his whole life trying to help the black community <laughs> with really? comics about fucking paper jams and memo tone. <laughs> I don't know. But now, after seeing this poll... Scott Adams decided that it doesn't make sense anymore for a white person to help the black community because, quote, it doesn't seem like it pays off. Oh. So that's why he was doing it, I guess. I've done the math and helping black people just isn't worth it to me anymore. I <laughs> am the good guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He's like the guy in the office who refuses to put money in the pool for people's birthday in case that person leaves the company before it's his birthday and he gets the money back. <laughs> You see, Scott, doing observational stuff about office life isn't hard. It's like, it's really easy. It's really easy to do. <laughs> Marsh just did it. Marsh has a job. That's fun. It's a fun thing about Marsh. Um, Scott Adams also added, 
I've been identifying as black for a while now, years now, because I like to be on the winning team. I have no idea what he's talking about. But as of today, I'm going to re-identify as white because I don't want to be a member of a hate group. They don't think it's okay for me to be white. Uh, Dib's not Jewish. What? Really, Eli? Stealing Heat's catchphrase. That's, that's a really good <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So over the last two weeks, Scott Adams lost the vast majority of his income. And, of course, that means it's time to lean hard right and launch a website for incel neo-Nazis. He'll be hosting Dilbert Reborn on his new subscription site. And just for the record, he was already leaning this direction politically for a while. For example, he introduced a black character into the comic recently who identifies as white. And that, of course, fucks up the company's diversity score. It's, it's really trenchant commentary about whatever he thinks he's commenting on. And in 2000, after his Dilbert TV show got canceled, he claimed it was the third job he lost for being white. He said exactly that. And no, it's fucking dumb and a lie. Just for the record, one of the jobs he must have been referring to was at Crocker National Bank, and he got laid off in 1986, along with thousands of other people. So, Part of the woke mob that he's complaining about here was the management of a bank in the 80s. <laughs> also, let's keep in mind, it's not okay to be white. It's fucking amazing to be white is the correct way. It's so fucking easy being white. To be clear, right. I don't mean like it's better. I mean it's, it's easier to be. And nobody knows that better than a black person in America being questioned by a GOP propaganda pollster. Yeah, yeah. Nobody 100%. should be surprised about the answers in this poll. Yeah, getting pulled over by the cops and not having to worry about getting shot sounds a fuck a lot better than just okay. It sounds brilliant. It sounds excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bottom line, just go ahead and ignore anything you see from Scott Adams and also anything you see from Rasmussen Media. Right. But but if you do want to check out the strips, they're on his uh, locals.com page. Oof. It's got a teaser on there. <laughs> and in Ask If You Musk News. Elon Musk's ownership of Twitter continues to be the second largest train wreck of 2023, with number one, of course, going to this season of The Bachelor, am I right? <laughs> anyway, yet another car of decorum flew off the tracks of hope this past weekend as Musk's reaction to being asked by a former employee if he still worked there was to mock said employee and question whether or not he was faking his disability, because Elon has figured out no matter what he does, we will not eat him. When your conflict resolution technique uh, at work are indistinguishable from John Goodman in The Big Lebowski, you, you, still, <laughs> you still somehow see yourself the smartest man in the world? There's a problem there. All right, say what you will about the tenets of national socialism. They deserve a digital platform. I'm going to give it to them. <laughs> so the employee in question, whose name I'm going to butcher, I'm sorry, is Haralder Thorlefison, who joined Twitter after it acquired his startup, you know. Uh, Thorlefson, who has muscular dystrophy and uses a wheelchair, spends his free time as a philanthropist in his home country of Iceland and has led an effort to build 1,500 wheelchair ramps across the nation to improve accessibility. It's it's so great. It's like this guy was designed in a lab to be the worst possible person for Elon Musk to pick a fight with. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Also, we found out that uh, his tears formed the basis of the COVID vaccine. And if anything, his <laughs> wife and children love and respect him too much. It's strange. Yeah. <laughs> he survived slavery and the Holocaust? Come on. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. He's a puppy? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> what? How is he a puppy? Anyway, that guy found himself locked out of his employee account at Twitter for more than a week, and after getting no answers from HR, tweeted directly at Musk, asking if he'd been laid off, to which the second richest man in the world replied, What work have you been doing? Hold on, wait, I'm locked out too. It says my two-factor authentication is $10 a month now. I got locked <laughs> out of my own company. Yeah. But uh, not to be put off by a little thing like waiting for more information, Musk immediately decided to start slandering Thorlefson. And I do mean slander because, as we're going to learn in a minute, I'm pretty sure that's the word Musk's lawyer screamed in the phone later that day. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, apropos of nothing, Musk said that Thorlefson, quote, did no actual work claimed as his excuse that he had a disability that prevented him from typing, yet was simultaneously tweeting up a storm, end quote. Said the owner of the company, who spends work time 
ringing up slander lawsuits against that company. Seriously? Like, if Thorlefson was doing nothing, that's so much better for the company. I'm sure he wasn't yeah. doing nothing when he was there. But that would have been better than what Elon Musk was doing in that moment. Also, and it's it's a really minor thing, but does Elon Musk not know that disabled people can use Twitter? Because that, that feels like the kind of information the owner of Twitter should have access to. Yep. Yep, he think. did not let that sink in. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, Elon Musk's lawyer read that tweet, uh, breathed into a paper bag for a little while, cried a little bit, called his high school girlfriend, hung up when she answered, and then he instructed <laughs> his client to apologize and offer Thorlifson so much motherfucking money. Like, so much. Which led Musk to tweeting, quote, I would like to apologize to Holly for my misunderstanding of this situation. It was based on things I was told that were untrue or in some cases true, but not meaningful. What? He is considering remaining at Twitter, end quote. And that, that apology is just, wait, let me explain. It's, it's not actually my fault. It's just that I, a, a powerful billionaire who thinks he's the smartest person in the world and who's in charge of the world's most efficient propaganda tool, actually just made this major fuck up because I just believe anything and act on anything I'm told without <laughs> checking it first. Hold on. No, no, that's my lawyer on the phone again. I've really got to take this. I've got to take this. Yeah. I run a company that should be called Ipsodixitism, the, the platform. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, they got to shut him down. Like somebody at IT at Twitter needs to just run Elon's phone into a fake Twitter full of chatbots when he doesn't realize it. He's Ooh. just like radio guy unplugged. Like he'll get into insane fights with basically himself and then he'll probably just tire himself out like a little kid or like you know <laughs> dog chasing a tail i feel like Absolutely. that's the move yeah now as of this record there is no word whether thorlefson will accept twitter's offer I, I assume musk's lawyer is sweatily adding zeros to a check and has been for days now but thorlefson lives in iceland where disability and slander laws though by no means perfect are actually pretty meaningful so i'm pretty sure there's like a disability slash slander lawyer also adding zeros to his proposal at the same right. time as Musk's lawyer. Wh whichever of those lawyers comes out ahead, Thorlefson is going to be the real winner. And that's about as good as news about Elon Musk as we can get until a story about him ends with salt, pepper, and a little bit of oregano. Oh, eat him to eat him. Eat him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And finally tonight in The End is NI News. <laughs> Do you guys remember Brexit? That was that decision that we made in 2016 that Boris officially got done in 2019, boxed off all fine. Um, well, in case you've been pay not been paying attention, that's all been going absolutely swimmingly. The UK is is finally oh. fine. We're all all right. We're finally free to enjoy the sunlit uplands of being the only member of the G7 whose economy is predicted to shrink this year. That, that's that's according to the IMF. There it is. Uh, who, who, fun fact, the IMF predict that our economy is going to fare worse than Russia's over the next 12 months. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, then have you guys considered losing a war to the Yorkshire Dales? Because apparently that's working for them. <laughs> if you don't think Yorkshire and parts of uh, Liverpool, where I'm from, want to secede to Scotland and an independent Scotland, uh, you are not paying attention to the politics of the UK. Um but maybe those nerds at the IMF are going to rip up that prediction, given that we now ha finally have a new solution to the land border between the UK and the EU, which is where Northern Ireland meets the Republic of Ireland. Because, you see, leaving the EU meant having to check goods and people as they move between the EU and the UK, which means checking everything and everyone that moves between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And that is something that has not been hugely popular historically, Except with Northern Ireland's boutique and artisanal explosive industry, for whom it was a, a real boom sure. time. <laughs> sure. Okay, did Banshees of Inishmore not show you the errors of your ways and unite you all as brothers? We gave you sad Colin Farrell, people. What more do they need, Heath? What more do your people need? <laughs> okay, I think it's a Uh Also, <laughs> my people are cops from upstate New York. It's Irish Americans. Like, they have no idea anything Marsh just said. They could not name any of those things, point them out on maps. No idea. But now that you mention it, I think they need a serious apology from Oliver Cromwell about that thing in 1649. That would make it better. <laughs> 
So the Tory solution to this whole Northern Ireland problem, ever since we took back control, has been to completely kick the can down the road and make it someone else's problem. We'll just keep holding this decision off and carry on as if we were still in the EU until we finally get to, uh, to someone who will solve this. Which, to be honest, isn't the worst strategy for a party that changes leaders as often as they do. <laughs> because it's been May's problem, it's been Boris's problem, it's been Liz Truss's problem, it's now Sunak's problem, just keep kicking it back. Um, But eventually they've been forced to come up with a solution, which is why just last week the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, met with Rishi Sunak at Windsor Park in order to come to a final agreement. I I just want to say that I find it extremely British of you to call agreeing to a meeting a solution, (laughs) (laughs) Marge. So their, their great plan is to essentially have two lanes for crossing the Irish border. So one lane for people who are just going about their daily Irish business. Uh, Marsh, I think they just say business, probably. That's fair. That's fair. They do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the other lane for people who are planning to take goods onwards into the rest of the EU or from there to the mainland UK. Just potatoes and green stuff. Just regular <laughs> the ir- business. Just us normal business. Got are it. you doing a jig across the border, sir? Because it's Irish business, don't you know? No, you're doing... But the thing is, all of this sounds great, except... What they're describing is basically just the honour system. Because if you really wanted to smuggle people or goods into or out of the EU, you just use the I solemnly swear I'm not up to no good lane. And then you hope that the <laughs> right. border guards don't bother looking too closely at you. And you've got to bear in mind that border is 300 miles long. And there's at least 200 different points where people routinely cross from Northern Ireland to the Republic. So you're going to need some pretty attentive border guards to enforce this two lane system. So how much smuggling will this enable? We've got absolutely no idea, but at least we've taken back control of our borders. And that's the important thing. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Plus side, going to be a lot easier for us to get weed at the next QED. It's called hospitality, (laughs) Marsh. Look it up. (laughs) Also, it's only smuggling because you did Brexit. It used to be called the economy, most of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this agreement's been called the Windsor Protocol, after the place where it was agreed. And that's a pretty fitting name, because just like the Windsor Knot, it's formal. It looks simple. It's really easy to mess up. It fucks up (laughs) if it's done too tightly. And it's got this whole other (laughs) strand to it that's completely impossible to see the size of. Sure. I have to look it up every time I want to do a Windsor, and I still hurt myself every time I try to do a Windsor. (laughs) I just, I like the, it's thick if you get it right. I like it. But at least it's a solution of sorts, and one that actually comes with some benefits for Northern Ireland. Um, as Sunak himself explained, Northern Ireland is the, in the unbelievably special and unique position in having privileged access, not just to the UK home market, but also the European Union single market. Nowhere else does that exist. It's like the world's most exciting economic zone. Which It's like know, that. It's all very interesting, but I can think of somewhere else that had both privileged access to the UK market and the European single market. And uh-huh. specifically, I'm thinking of the UK circa 2015, where we had yeah. both those things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's like when monogamous people are describing how they wish they could have one last night as a single person to sow their wild oats again. You're like, oh, you're so close to getting it. You're so, <laughs> oh, you're so close. So, yeah, it's really great to hear Tory leaders explaining how valuable membership of the European Union is. I just wish we weren't hearing it seven years after they took that away from the rest of us and then left us being economically outperformed by a country currently under international sanctions because of ongoing war crimes. That would have been great. That would have been great. (laughs) All right. On that note, I think we're going to close it out. End on a wish. Thanks to Michael Marshall. Thanks to Eli Bosnick. And thanks to all the listeners who like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and send us feedback on the other various internets. Please keep doing that. Please keep listening. And please keep telling your friends. And if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming, please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat. Just like Tim Coppola, Cameron Gillies, Scott Davis, Hector Quintanilla, John Setterfield, Insane Atheist, John Coche, It's Been Day, Caldwell Dugan, Jennifer Chikowsky, Leslie, the moderately attractive atheist, ooh, ooh, Morgan DeVitt, Kicker Mike, the wandering menstrual, and Dustin Hutchinson, whose eminently diplomatic dicks and vaginas could easily resolve that whole England stealing Ireland thing. <laughs> if Marsh wants to apologize for Cromwell, he can hop in whenever he wants. It's fine. <laughs> 
or just, you know, kick it down the road. it will be a new leader in power. It's fine. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people, if you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more dick jokes free of charge, check out our brother and sister shows, The Skating Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed, available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all those other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slonick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. I'm sorry if you were offended by what Oliver Cromwell did. <laughs> 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 but when does Oliver Cromwell get to do stand up again, Heath? That's the- I'm sorry Oliver Cromwell made you feel bad. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze there. I'm not. That's fine. And finally tonight, Liar. In the end is NI news. <laughs> sorry, I did not hear that. You, you called you said, him a liar. Yeah, I said liar. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.